Hello, everyone. Welcome to the TED interview. I'm Chris Anderson, and today I'm talking to an ecologist who's played really a catalytic role in the debate about the best way to tackle climate change. In 2019, Dr. Thomas Crowther published a paper that grabbed headlines around the world because he offered an incredible natural solution to what might just be the biggest problem we collectively are facing right now, namely, what do we do with all of this extra carbon in our atmosphere? So his paper suggested that there was room on Earth to fit one trillion more trees, trillion with a T. That would be an increase of about a third of what we have. When our research was accepted to be published in the journal Science, nothing could have prepared us for the media explosion that followed. And it would be those extra trees that could become the key to avoiding climate catastrophe. Suddenly, governments and companies all around the world were pledging their commitment to the restoration of Earth's forests. And with the job creation that would result, the idea of a global restoration movement was becoming a reality. But then came pushback too, including pushback from scientists who thought Tom Crowther had oversimplified the issue. Now, this was a suggestion that he himself bravely accepted in a talk that he gave last year at TED's Countdown Initiative. But in the excitement of it all, and with the chance to make that positive impact I'd always dreamed of, I made some naive and stupid mistakes in communication that threatened the entire message. So today I'm really excited to talk to Tom and get to the bottom of what the science really is here. And then to think about how we could use it to do something pretty amazing. Because look, the truth is, this is still a really big idea. The Earth's natural systems could well be our biggest single ally in trying to return our planet to a future that we can all get excited about. So, here is Dr. Thomas Crowther. Okay, then, I am here with Dr. Thomas Crowther. Tom, welcome to the TED interview. Thanks so much. It's really exciting to be here. So we're going to have a conversation about big things, <laughs> trees, forests, um, the carbon cycle, um, the future of the planet, the future of humanity, things like that. Just the basics. <laughs> um, yeah, exactly. I, I'm definitely excited for the conversation. But um, I think a good place to start is with this postdoc project you did at Yale, where you, you tried to answer this really surprising question, how many trees are there on the planet? Where did that question come from? And how did you go about answering it? Yeah, yeah, this was um, one out of left field for me too, in reality. So as a postdoc, I um, was working on, on fungi and their interactions in the soil. Um, and if, if you can imagine, I was lost in the detail of that fascination. But one of my friends was working for the UN's Billion Tree Campaign to restore a billion trees to help climate change and, and biodiversity loss. And it was a really, you know, compelling and exciting movement that they were associated with. And he just constantly asked me if I can help them get an understanding of the scale of their challenge to understand, you know, what is a billion trees going to do? Is that a big contribution to climate change? Is it a tiny contribution? Until we know how many trees exist, it's hard to know whether that's just a drop in the bucket or not. And obviously, I, you know, to me, it seemed like an overwhelming task, but quite a fun one to get involved with. So we started, you know, thinking about the approaches. We thought, OK, we've got satellite data that can show us the greenness of every single location around the world. That's that's really valuable starting point. But you can't see below the canopy surface. You can't see the number of stems and the number of plants that are in those ecosystems. You just see how green they are. So we decided to take a sort of new approach where rather than basing it only on those satellites, we reached out to thousands and thousands of ecologists around the world who'd physically stood on the ground evaluating their ecosystems and counting the trees and seeing how big they are and which species they are. And they were all able to send us information from their locations. So if you imagine we've got now thousands of dots around the world where we know how many trees there are. And we also know how green they are and we know how warm it is and how wet it is. And with all that information, we can now start to see, OK, when it's this warm and this wet and this much soil carbon, we tend to see this many trees. So we could 
use machine learning and artificial intelligence to pair all that information together to say in any other location around the world, based on how green it is and how warm it is and how moist it is, we can probably estimate to some good level of accuracy how many trees there are based on the, the numbers that those people had counted. And so we ended up just doing that for every single pixel on the planet, which generates a map. And by adding up all the numbers on that map, we can now estimate how many trees there were. And somehow, putting all these pieces together, you came up with this number of three trillion trees, which for your friend at the UN, that is a, that is a oh my goodness, that's a huge moment. We've been thinking about a billion trees. You know, that is one three thousandth of the total number of trees on the planet. That's a tiny little tick on a dial. It doesn't, it doesn't really amount to anything. So people talk about a billion trees in terms of the global issue. They're talking about almost nothing, correct? Well, I wouldn't say almost nothing. Uh, I would say those trees, if restored in a really healthy way, you know, empower local communities and local biodiversity. But yes, in terms of the global number, yeah, it really put things in context for them. And honestly, I was really nervous when the paper came out that it was going to be really demotivating for them. They're going to say, oh my God, it was hard to do a billion. How are we going to, ever going to you know, restore a trillion trees? But absolutely the opposite. When, when we launched that information, the, you know, they and the rest of the world jumped on it and they're like, wow, brilliant. Look at the scale of this thing. Now we know what we've got to try and achieve. Let's get going. And it was a really positive moment. So you followed up this work with, I guess, well, first of all, some more ecological work of, of the relationship between trees and soil, carbon cycle. You know, there's obviously every year there's a huge amount of carbon sequestered and then released by natural systems. What is the scale of that in terms of gigatons of CO2 being effectively released and reabsorbed each year? Well, so ultimately, you know, terrestrial ecosystems release and absorb about 120 gigatons every single year. So it's a big annual flux. You know, we're, we're releasing carbon into the atmosphere and then it's been absorbed back into the ecosystems. But the nice thing is those two processes are relatively imbalanced. Mm. And so for thousands of years, the balance in those ecosystems has led to a relatively stable climate. Now, the problem is humans are emitting what is a relatively small amount of carbon, actually. It's only around 10 gigatons of carbon each year. It's just that it's not being counterbalanced by any uptake. And so every year, year on, year out, we're increasing that, you know, the carbon concentrations in the atmosphere, which is gradually warming the climate. I mean, it's, I think that's interesting context. Over time, that's enough to create a massive problem of all this excess carbon in the atmosphere. And that's carbon that the planet can't absorb. You're, you're exactly right. The, the, the scale of what we're doing is relatively small, but it's the fact that we're not balanced out by any uptake that means it's constantly growing. All right, so having counted the number of trees, um, you started asking another question, which is, well... How many more could we plant? And this led to this headline-grabbing paper that you published, make, making the case that actually, you know, there was room for another trillion trees. And this, you know, this created huge excitement because you, you argued in that paper that if we did that somehow, that that alone could address a really meaningful proportion of the entire climate problem. First of all, talk about that calculation and then some of the reaction to it and how your own position has evolved in the process. Yeah, this is <laughs> this is a topic that has gained all of the attention in my world. And so it's a focus of a lot of the questions. But essentially, we use those same models that predict where trees can grow. And we extended them across the world as it, almost in imagining that humans weren't here. And that allowed us to see that wow, we are almost at half the number of trees that would naturally exist under this climate. If humans were to vanish, there would be almost twice as many trees growing across the world, which is quite a staggering human footprint already. But obviously, you know, we're all very much in favor of humans being here. We, <laughs> we use a lot of land for urban land uh, and, and a lot more land for agricultural land, which we, you know, have used to feed an ever-growing human population. But what we found is that outside of those, you know, human managed lands, there's about 0.9 billion hectares. So about a third of the sort of area of forests that exist now 
um, that is available for, for trees to sort of naturally regrow. And yet, I think this finding sparked off the most exciting but also chaotic and, and controversial set of discussions in this field for, for quite some time. What was the trillion tree calculation? Was that based on those hectares or was it also about increasing density elsewhere uh, on the planet? No, that's a good question, actually. So we we estimated that the 0.9 billion hectares under present forest conditions is room for about a trillion new trees. So that's, again, if we could protect all of those areas and allow those trees to recover, there'd be a, about a trillion new trees. Um So I guess we estimated as well, within that forested land, if the whole ecosystems were to recover, they'd be able to capture in the order of about 200 gigatons of carbon, which is quite a staggering number. That's in the order of about 30% of all the excess carbon that humans have emitted into the atmosphere until now. So it would really represent a significant chunk in that, you know, contribution to the climate change topic. And and did you mean that it would capture that sort of one time but effectively permanently is is that is that the basic idea that 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 amount would be permanently taken out well yeah well there's a lot to unpack there because first that 200 gigatons would take about 100 years to accumulate so it's not like it would just be done and then we're offsetting 20 years of our emissions um so first yeah it takes a long time but it's also worth noting that yes, it should be it should be counted once. If we if we then restore all of those ecosystems to full natural health, and they then stay there, that's a, a one time two hundred gigaton thing. They don't they won't continue uh, growing beyond that, at least in our in our expectation of it. And so it's really worth noting that this is you know it's a useful part, but it's only a fraction of what we really need in the full fight against climate change. But I think the reason it captured everyone's imagination so much is that this contribution to climate change isn't just about carbon capture. It's one that also comes with the benefits of biodiversity and human well-being that, that were mm. a lot more exciting um, around the world. Well, indeed, the notion of a, of a greener planet with all these ecosystems that allow our fellow creatures to thrive, I mean, that that is a beautiful picture. And it's certainly a more emotionally appealing sort of way of addressing climate change than imagining these sort of vast machines that might, you know, suck CO2 out of the air directly at some huge expense. Because for a lot of people, the framing that is easier to imagine is not 100 years, which seems like forever. A lot of people are worried about, you know, the next three or four decades, we've, we've got this plan to try and get to net zero emissions by 2050 at the very latest. So in terms of a massive tree planting and forest management campaign over the next few years. Like of those 10 excess gigatons every year that are going out, is there a way of imagining us accounting for, say, one or two or three of those gigatons annually? There's people suggesting that it could be, you know, one or even two gigatons per year if it was really adopted across massive spatial scales. Now, that obviously brings the next wave of uncertainty around these numbers, which is first, implementing that is an immensely difficult challenge. It requires engagement from every sector of society, from the political level all the way down to the, you know, the practitioner on the ground who needs the local marketplaces in order to be sustainable and, 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 and things like that. But it's also worth noting that it's not just about the carbon, because if, yeah, we talk about offsetting, you know, maybe one gigaton or two gigatons per year, which would be incredible. But if we're doing that all in the boreal forest, then we'll probably having be having a slightly warming impact on the planet, <laughs> because actually high latitude trees actually absorb a lot more of the sun's energy than the snow that would otherwise be there. And they actually increase the temperature of those locations. So it's really important also to know where these restoration efforts are happening and how they're happening. But in order to put it into that context, yeah, I I think we're starting to get a handle of what that carbon contribution is. I mean, it's it's interesting, Tom, like th- there's this sort of unifying theme around a lot of your work, which is is this sort of meta view of the world, like big data. You, you have realized that there's a series of questions that can only be answered if you kind of pull the camera way back and figure out ways to look at the big, you know, the really big picture. Um, 
was there a moment where you just got really excited about this this idea or this this approach? What what triggered this as a sort of focus of your own thinking? That's a funny question because actually, I. I'm not going to say this is the exact cause, but it definitely corresponded with a time in my life. Um, I was when I was at Yale, as I mentioned. I, I, you know, I still am fascinated by the minutiae, by the the fungus in the petri dish that's interacting with the kalemba. You know, this bug in the soil. It's I'm I'm I love that detail. But when I was actually studying in Yale, I, I had a stroke, which is quite a big change in my life, wow. as you can imagine. Um, and. I genuinely believed I was going to die. It was, it, you know, it was called a pontine stroke. It's a very serious kind of stroke. Um, and it was obviously jarring and shocking. And I remember distinctly coming out of hospital thinking, first, I'm never going to drink again. That one didn't last very well. But <laughs> the other one is I need to, I need to put all of this work in perspective. I need to see the relevance of what I'm doing and the relevance of what everyone else is doing. And I, I, I need to be able to scale out so that I can comprehend what our targets are, what my impact is. Um, and that was definitely the dis- sort of defining idea that, that, that motivates all these global scale things. Goodness me. You know, I was talking yesterday with Joe Balter Taylor, who has a famous TED talk called, you know, My Stroke of Insight. It's amazing <laughs> that you kind of had your own stroke of insight there and that, the, wow, what a, what a sequence of events. So I want to go back, Tom, to this paper that you published where the headlines were all, you know, if we were to plant a trillion trees, we could, we could make a massive contribution to solving the climate problem. That paper ended up coming in for quite a lot of, of criticism, which, which you've addressed. I mean, what were the main sources of criticism of what happened? And talk about to what extent it was people sort of misunderstanding the headline for the underlying claims that you were making and and to what extent like if you could have your time back you would have restated a few things differently yeah yeah it's 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 a really interesting one because there's a kind of a a thousand things i'd like to discuss here but ultimately the the first point is you know that estimate of a trillion trees and 200 gigatons of carbon you know doesn't manage to include all of the complexity we've just talked about about the ecological system and how trees can have a warming impact in some places and and ecosystems generate very very slowly so that that was a lot of the discussion but by far the biggest errors that we made is when the media explosion began it sounded like planting trees can offset climate change, or at least the vast majority of it. Not only is that factually incorrect, it's really, really damaging to the climate change movement because it suggests that we don't need the thousands and thousands of other technological solutions that we urgently, urgently need to limit greenhouse gas emissions. So, you know, it came across like a really damaging message for the climate change movement, and it made it seem like protecting the ecosystems we currently have is not as important as planting a load of new trees, which is fundamentally backwards. You know, of course, preserving the nature that we still have is the top priority, and then we want to be building on top of that. But I think by far my biggest failure, and I don't know how this happened, because in the paper we we never mention it, but it's simply the idea of tree planting being the, the, the only approach. The idea that restoration is planting a trillion trees, not only is that physically impossible, you know, it take all of humanity tens of thousands of years to plant a trillion trees, but it's also really dangerous because the monoculture plantations that we see people restoring all over the place are devastating for ecosystems. Uh, it's much, much, much healthier to work with nature so that those trees can recover naturally. And, you know, we can facilitate that with tree planting in some areas that can really speed things up or bring back biodiversity in a better way. What we wanted to communicate is that this is a place where trees can regenerate and nature can return, not the idea that we can plant a trillion trees everywhere. I mean, you've taken risks as a scientist that other scientists haven't always done. And it's kind of got you into hot water on occasion because you've gone out and been bold in what you've said. You know, I I think this is a really interesting thing because it seems to me there's there is this trade-off between the impact that science has and boldness. You've got this quote that uh, I really like, I think, although it's, it's, it's self-critiquable. You say, science without communication is nothing. It's not even a thing. It's just papers in people's 
drawers. Why did you why did you say that? <laughs> yeah, I, d- I don't know how I feel about that quote. I mean, the the point is, I know thousands of brilliant scientists who do incredible things every day. But it's, I think that, you know, that they can, they are so much smarter than me. They're so much, you know, genius people. Um, but the, but often the, the challenge to getting their science across is the communication part. Um, and that ability to, it, you, you really see the ones that stand out are the ones that find that key to being able to communicate the findings. Because, you know, the natural world, the physical world is chaos and there's a million molecules moving in all directions. And we're, the job of a scientist is not just to provide evidence that it's complicated. It's to try to see the patterns through that complicated chaos to, to provide insights that we can all use in our daily lives. And yeah, I, I really believe that the best scientists are the ones who not only find those cool patterns, but are able to, to communicate that message in a way that, that cuts through the noise so that we can all sort of react to it. But I think it's a, the, the problem that scientists face, that you face, that I've faced actually, you know, running Ted, is that, that we're, all of this is happening in the context of information bedlam. You know, there's this attention war out there that is crazy. And, and so the, often the way you get around that is to have the big headline. Now, you know, your original paper had this big headline, a trillion trees could save humanity kind of thing, which you yourself have now critiqued some aspects of that. And yet, without the boldness of that, um, th- this whole topic might might still be invisible to millions and millions of people for whom it is now visible. Like that paper led to billionaires committing huge sums of money, for example, to work on this problem in some way. And so it's, it's a really interesting question, how you find that balance. I think that somehow we have to recognize that there's more that matters than just being 100% correct on every detail. It actually also matters to be willing to take the risk to go out and say something that people actually can latch onto and that has a chance of, you know, putting its head up above the parapet and being seen and and so forth. <clears throat> At least then a conversation starts. I mean, this is a dilemma, right? Yeah. It totally is. It's the biggest dilemma in my life. And I think everyone in the in the spotlight experienced the same dilemma. You know, there is a perfect trade-off between making the neat, clean headline and explaining the nuance. And finding that balance is the key to being a really good communicator. And and I think clearly, as you mentioned, I've I've I, I'm very aware that I've missed that balance in the past. I've gone too simple or too clear. But if I hadn't you're exactly right. Millions of people wouldn't be quite as aware of the true value that nature can unlock. So while I regret the, 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 the nuance of the framing, I'm still so glad that that message was able to punch through. And I do think we need to have a society where, where people are more likely to embrace the bold statements, but, but giving people, I guess, the chance to then explain the nuance in the background. Mm. You know, I think as long as the, the nuance exists, those bold statements can be so powerful for pushing us forward and sort of making waves that, that impact society. Well, one great trait that you have in combination with the willingness to be bold is you're willing to admit error and uh, in, in a sort of non-defensive way. I thought your TED talk that you gave for Countdown, and by the way, if, if you haven't seen this talk, listeners, dear listeners, check it out. It is it is amazing. It was shot direct to camera with an amazing um, panoply of different graphical devices that help make the story clear. And it includes an undefensive, beautiful acknowledgement of some of the things that went wrong in the initial uh, uh, messaging. I think to me that that was a very winning approach that you took there. I, I think us all, like when the, we're facing so many of these issues, you, we, we could all hope for a conversation where people are willing to be bold, are willing to be a bit less judgmental, but are also, yes, willing to upgrade and to say, okay, now let's let's critique how that was and get to a better framing of it. I heard you doing that during that talk. I've heard you doing that live today. It's that that to me at least feels feels very good. Yeah, I I, I think you're right. I mean, given the the chaos of, of of that paper, it was definitely useful for me to to come out and 
apologize for the fact that I, you know, I was trying to get the message right and I clearly missed my mark. And that's, you know, that that's something we all learn and grow from. But yeah, I totally agree with you. I'd love to see a society where that's more embraced, where, you know, trade-offs in communication approaches can be recognized and discussed in a more embracing way. Because I think these communication challenges, whether they're perfectly communicated or not, they still push the conversation forward in a way that can be really useful. Well, indeed, as, as a result of your work, the United Nations Billion Tree Campaign is now a trillion tree campaign. That is a thousand X step up in ambition. That is worth something. I'm sorry, but that is worth something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's something. <laughs> All right. So do you still believe that there is a future healthier planet that in contains maybe the same number of humans we have now and also a trillion more trees, but that the pathway there is not to plant them, but to, but to allow nature itself by and large to regrow those trees? Is that a more accurate way of saying what, what you wish the interpretation of the paper had been? Yeah, I think the, the first thing that pops into many people's minds is, cool, let's plant loads and loads of fast-growing trees, catch load of, loads of carbon, and we're done. Um, but it's absolutely not the process that will work in any way. Not only will it make unsustainable systems that don't last very long, uh, and trap much carbon, they also will destroy all the biodiversity that's necessary for the, the maintenance of those ecosystems. In reality, what we want is healthy nature recovering under its own power. And, and you know, we can speed that up by planting some of the right trees that maybe bring food or medicines that you can sell in the local marketplaces and, and make economic uh, value out of that. But really, a, a trillion trees is about nature in its full, you know, full glory with all the, the plants and animals and microbes and insects that are necessary to keep that nature healthy and sustainable in, in conjunction with the local communities that are finding the beneficial ways that, that that nature promotes their own well-being and economic sustainability. So we, we want a flourishing biodiversity and human population and hu human communities, not just plantations all over the world to catch carbon. It's much bigger than just carbon. I mean, you've worked with a lot of different groups over the last couple of years, and especially as you're, you've become a kind of go-to person in terms of the big picture. Have you come across projects that have really inspired you where you've thought, wow, that is the right way to do this? Yeah, it's it's really crazy to answer this because people often ask, you know, how can you be optimistic about climate change as a climate change scientist? And it's because I'm meeting every single day people with the most inspiring stories about bringing back nature that brings back well-being to human communities. And it's so incredible. One project I was literally speaking with last night is actually a coffee shop owner here in Zurich who's from Ethiopia. They were trying to grow coffee in Ethiopia for a very long time. And they were struggling with this sort of exploitative uh, approach that's, that's there. And it, it means that after a few years, your yields tend to go down. And they, they were trying to figure out ways to make that yield more sustainable. At the same time, he recognized that they were in a beautiful part of the world. And they didn't want to have an increasing impact in that beautiful part of the world. Um, and they found the most simple, clear solution I've seen, which is they, they started integrating their coffee plantations within um, naturally forested regions, which have natural gaps in the canopy. And those gaps in the canopy allow light to come through. And then the, the coffee plants, which are native to the region, grow really, really well in that diverse, healthy, nutritious, uh, you know, ecosystem that's storing loads of carbon. And actually their yields went up relative to the farms that were next door. So not only are they getting more yield, but they're having to do less work. They're having to do less irrigation. They're having to do less, uh, you know, management because they're integrating their coffee practice into a natural ecosystem that's ready there. And it's incredible. When you fly a drone over that land, you cannot see the difference between that their farm and the adjacent natural forested ecosystem. And those profits are able to go back to the community where they've got now multiple schools also working on the same thing, trying to like develop agroforestry practices so that they can be more economically sustainable. Um, and that's just one example, but there are thousands. 
I mean, it's kind of amazing that that works. Like that was very counterintuitive. Like someone thinking in terms of efficiency would think, how could that possibly work? You've got all these trees in the way. You know, you might get more yield per plant, but surely it's more expensive to sort of go out and harvest and plant in the first place. You you know, you, you must be on a bigger geographic area per yield or no. I mean, it, this really works. It, the incredible thing is that it does work incredibly well. Their yield's gone so far up, but that's partially because it takes so much less management. They, It is true that they are uh, planting their um, cocoa uh, plants across a wider geographic range, but it's having a negligible impact on the environment because those are plants that would naturally be there anyway. They don't have to water. They don't have to spread nutrients. They don't have to do any of the land management practices because the ecosystems are doing it for them. Those forests mm. are trapping water. All you know, They're nice, moist, rich forests. The animals are, are fertilizing the seeds and spreading the, um, uh, spreading the seeds everywhere. The, the, the nutrients and water are trapped in the soil. And, it, and so it's actually a very sort of hands-off approach um, that really works. But it's worth mentioning that that is not the same kind of ecosystem that exists everywhere. So it's, it's kind of a good example of how that definitely works where he is in the cafe region in, in Ethiopia. But it wouldn't work in a fully, you know, full canopy forest in the middle of Brazil, and it wouldn't work in a savanna in, in sub-Saharan Africa. So the approach for effective restoration varies everywhere around the world, depending on the ecosystem that's already there. But really the biggest challenge isn't the practical one of getting the trees back. The real challenge is about making the economic incentives so that nature restoration is a viable option and a sustainable option for local communities. When you get biodiversity coming back, you often see that soil fertility improves and soil moisture improves and then your crops improve and your economic gains improve. And it's when you see all of those benefits happening that the conservation and restoration of these ecosystems happens in the long term and they have the biggest benefits for all of us. Uh, so those are the challenges. And the, the, the difficulty is those challenges are different in every single location around the world. Some places you need agroforestry, others you need holistic soil management of farms, others you need to just put a fence around that garden and don't let the sheep go there because they'll eat down all your trees. Um, but it's ultimately building that massive patchwork of, of networked uh, connections where people are doing different practices all over the world to allow nature to recover and benefit all of us. Tom, how should we think about trees grown for timber? Like I've heard it argued by environmentalist. Um, one of the huge problems for CO2 release is, is concrete, cement. If we could replace them with timber, create these sort of like even skyscrapers now you can build out of wood, that that would be a massive win. I mean, it's interesting, you know, psychologically, a lot of people just get upset at the thought of any tree being cut down. But when you think about it, take two scenarios. One, a tree just dies, falls to the ground and rots part of the natural carbon cycle, and eventually its nutrients, some are absorbed, CO2 is released, but a new tree grows. But, but that versus that tree being carted off and put into a building where that wood will actually never rot. And the, you know, the rotting process, that's what releases the CO2 back into the atmosphere, basically, right? Right. And so, so someone, someone in a way could take joy at the thought of um, trees being harvested in in the sustainable way um so long as a, a new tree is planted essentially or a new tree is allowed to grow that way you're continually capturing carbon permanently from that forest yeah remember i started as a microbial ecologist and i'm obsessed with fungi and how they interact with the, the microbes in decomposing wood so i definitely wouldn't <laughs> like us to remove all the decomposing wood because that is that's also how we form soil carbon in forests and how we support immense amounts of biodiversity but you are exactly right 
you know, there's huge positivity in the fact that we can selectively remove trees from a developing forest, which not only speeds up the development and the, the health of that forest, but it also provides a load of timber that will then trap the carbon away for however long that that timber is used for however long that house stands you know that's an incredible uh, incredibly valuable carbon store and there's you know i'm not an economist there's loads of economists working on the, the the value of of that part of the carbon storage process like when it's turned into rocking horses or or you know whatever it is how long does that carbon stay trapped and it's an ongoing research discussion but for me it's a really exciting avenue for carbon capture and storage i mean i would like to ask you about the economics of this a bit because like thinking of trees and forests as a carbon sequestration solution if you like so put yourself you know like let's come back and look at this from the point of view of humanity overall we've got this huge problem we're trying to resolve it looks like it's going to be really hard to get to net zero by 2050 almost certainly we're going to have to spend money capturing carbon from the atmosphere even if we get to net zero there's still going to be all this excess co2 in the atmosphere but i mean the technological solutions that they're, they're hugely expensive like right now it's several hundred dollars per ton of carbon people see a pathway to get that down to maybe a hundred dollars or less per ton but i haven't heard of much optimism about getting much below that number and yet in forests right now you can by carbon offsets at sort of 5 to $10 a ton or less. Right now, it seems that just from a pure economic standpoint, if we were wise, we would be investing a lot more money in letting nature do its thing. Right. I get asked this a lot as well, because, you know, it seems like there's this conflict between approaches. And I guess my stance is and will always be, we desperately need those technological solutions to draw carbon out of the atmosphere. They are going to be incredible. They're going to be game changing uh, and they are going to get better and better the more and more we invest in them and the more that carbon market becomes, you know, a sustainable avenue for, for them making money. So they're brilliant. And we work so closely with several organizations, particularly Climeworks is a group here in Zurich that literally has the same funders as we do. Um, and I think that you know it's it's so nice to see that investing in one does not come at the expense of investing in another we need all of them however i totally share your perspective that we need to get going on climate action right now and i see no more valuable thing that we can do than getting going with nature we can get going on this right now we don't need a carbon market to develop and evolve we don't need technology to improve we don't need costs to come down in the interim, but before we get these, you know, these incredible technological solutions, I think it's essential that we get the process going on carbon sequestration in nature, as long as it's being done in an ecologically responsible way. But I mean, the entrepreneur, the businessman inside me says, wait a sec, there's, there's, there's more than an order of magnitude difference in costs right now in these two approaches. Like doing smart forest management is a really hard thing to do versus, you know, the excitement of I'm going to build a company that does direct carbon capture. That is a sort of controllable process that it's easier to imagine in some ways for some people, whereas, you know, forest management is really complex. But when it's more than an, an order of magnitude difference in costs currently, why on earth aren't we fighting harder to do this the right way? It seems like for far less money, we could make far more difference much earlier. What, what is the blockage that stops much um, deeper investment in this particular approach? Mm. Yeah, it's a very good question, because you're right. This is available to us now. It's affordable, it's achievable, and it's a win-win if done right. Um, and I think the blockage is that we are all entirely disconnected from nature. Now, this it seems sort of a, a bit philosophical, but when we get on a plane or do whatever it is we're doing and, you know, give our $1 to offset our emissions, we have absolutely no idea where that goes. And so it's hard to, to, to really invest in something that we're so disconnected from. Anyone can imagine a machine sucking carbon out. Okay, I'll invest in that. But to invest in the economic development of a local community around nature-based solutions seems complicated and weird. And, and I think we, 
we don't until now we haven't been able to see the value of, of those actions and and i think opening that up is the key to reaching the potential so so you're working on this um talk a bit about the platform that you're working on i guess you're working on it with google this new platform called restore restore missing an e at the end do i have that right <laughs> Yeah, we had to brand it somehow. We just <laughs> remove an E. <laughs> so we want to bring transparency and connectivity to the environmental movement. Um, so Restore's, it, it, you know, it's like a mapping website, like Google Maps. It's just instead of seeing hairdressers and shops, you see restoration projects and farms. So it's a place where you can log in and you can see the 20,000, 30,000, 40,000 places around the world where people are restoring trees, protecting wetlands, doing holistic agriculture. And you can see what they're doing. You can track them over the last decade. You can see how those plants have changed and, and, gr and, and grown in different ways. You can learn about the people doing it. And you can then obviously engage with those, with those organizations by funding them or by buying their products or by volunteering with them. But the much more valuable data comes from those real people on the ground who are then uploading information about their soils and about their vegetation and about their, you know, their strategies. And that is feeding back into, into the scientific community. So all their data goes back to the academic community who build better models and improve and refine the, the predictions about everywhere else in the world. I mean, is there an AI aspect to this that says... If that species is flourishing there and there and there, that implies that this particular combination of of uh, temperature and soil or whatever is is its magic uh, sweet spot, and therefore it should also work here, 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 and here. Is there an AI yeah. thing going on that will help people kind of get direct recommendations of, boy, in your place where you are, you you could give this plant a shot, and you might be amazed. That is exactly it. Yeah, we've got the sort of sweet spot for all the different plants uh, and where they grow. So it can say, right, in your garden, these are the plants that can grow and they produce this fruit or this medicine or this carbon storage. But yeah, we learn also from the co-occurrences with other plant species. So certain plants often live with other plants. And so we can say, right, actually, if you've got that plant species in your garden, then these species might be very likely to live there. And it can even tell you, whether they will be likely to live there in the future under climate change too. So you can sort of make decisions that plan ahead for the impacts of warming and drying or, or whatever's happening in, in those ecosystems. When, when does it launch, Tom? It'll be launching in the second half of this year. I really think this can be the sort of transparency that's needed in the environmental movement. It's, it's opening up the book so that everyone can see all the restoration efforts going on around the world, which means that we can actually get data from all those tens of thousands of locations to learn which approaches are working and failing and succeeding and, and struggling around the world, which is gold for science. But we've got some really exciting stuff coming up soon, both on the potential for carbon storage if we just protect the trees that currently exist, and that is immense potential in itself, but also to show where in the world we need to plant trees, where we need to be active in our restoration, and where will they just recover naturally? Because once we know that, that's a bit of our holy grail to be able to say, right, this is how you manage that land, this is how you manage that land. Uh, and that, I think, will unlock a lot of potential. So put the pieces together for us, Tom. I mean, what do you think? You know, climate change, it, do you see a pathway out of this? <laughs> how likely do you think it is that we'll take that pathway? Look, I, I, I'm not going to suggest that we're going to get to net zero in 10 years and, and suck all the excess carbon in the, out of the atmosphere and it'll all be fine. Even if we did that, it would, you know, climate change would still continue. But I'm incredibly optimistic about what we're already seeing, this sort of re revolution in the way people are thinking about their, their footprint on the environment and their footprint on nature. And we are seeing mass restoration and conservation efforts popping up all over the world which are preserving biodiversity and human livelihoods all over the world which is innately having incredible benefits um we're also seeing these impacts you know changes happening in agriculture and in industry that are improving efficiency and so w while we may not totally offset climate change i think there's an incredibly bright future that we will evolve into you know it's not like climate change happens or it doesn't we're either winning or we've lost i think we are undoubtedly going to continue experiencing changes in climate and changes in conditions over the next century. But 
with the revolution of of new technological and environmental approaches that we're seeing to deal with these changes, I think it can be a really bright future and an exciting one for biodiversity and for humans. Tom, we've been talking about trees and the best way to plant them. Um, how about planting ideas? You've got a chance now just to, as we close, to plant one idea in everyone's mind who's listening. I guess it would be that in almost every decision we take, we have an impact on nature. You know, I think most of us inherently love nature and we'd love to minimize our impact on it. But every bit of food we buy, every clothes we buy, every product we, we, we purchase has an impact on nature. And now, if we were to be able to see that impact, we would all have the power with every decision to make a positive impact on nature rather than a negative impact on nature. I mentioned this coffee shop in Zurich. They're going to be the first coffee shop to be on Restore. And they, they, you know, they essentially want to have an iPad at the front of their store where you come up and you buy your coffee and they can say, look, this is the farm we get our coffee from. This is, this is the, these are the coffee plants that are growing. These are the people. So then you now, when you decide, oh, I want to buy coffee from here or coffee from here, you're going to say, oh, I'll buy it from the sustainable one where they're actually improving nature rather than this other one that I have no idea about. And I'd love it that one day a thousand coffee shops have that, which means that the Starbucks next door mm. are pressured to show where their coffee's coming from. And then everyone goes, whoa, what's that all about? And they can, that pressure can then be used to improve the sustain, you know, the supply chain of Starbucks coffee and, and everyone else. That, that's kind of the image I want to get in everyone's heads that like, if we were able to see every coffee plant, we can make decisions that save the day. Excellent. Tom Crowther, thank you. Thanks so much. That was Tom Crowther. Now, their platform, Restore, will be available later this year. And if you want to learn more, just go ahead and visit the website, restore, without an E, dot eco. So that's R-E-S-T-O-R dot E-C-O. I'd also love to hear from you directly. I really like hearing what you think. You can write to me at tedchris at ted.com. That's T-E-D-C-H-R-I-S at ted.com. Or consider just writing a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you are listening to this. The TED interview is part of the TED Audio Collective. That's a collection of podcasts dedicated to sparking curiosity and sharing ideas that matter. The show is produced by Kim Nadefane Peterson and edited by Grace Rubenstein and Sheila Orfano. Our mixer is Sam Baer. Fact check is by Christiane Aparta. And a special thanks to Michelle Quint, Colin Helms, Nicole Bodie, and Anna Phelan. And thank you to you for listening. See you next time. <laughs>